Hello, good morning. So welcome again to this World Large River and the Delta uh, System, the Source to Sync, the online webinar series. So today uh, we will get Dr. Liz Chaplin from Vanderbilt and Lamont and NCL, uh, Netherlands, to give us talk about the dating deltas, particularly focused on the example of the Mississippi and the Ganges Puma Putra deltas. So before um, her talk, I introduce her. I will, like uh, before, I would introduce our next webinar next week, next Wednesday, the same time on 26 uh, to 9 a.m. U.S. Eastern time and in the afternoon in Paris and London and in the evening in Beijing. So we will be very happy to get Dr. Hans-Jörg Seaboard, Hans. Uh, he will talk about the controls of the global river channel network from the source to sink point of view. And Hans is from Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. The ETH is Edinga uh, Neshi Technisch Hochschule Zurich. Uh, so uh, please uh, mark your calendar and uh, coming back next Wednesday. And so uh, Liz, um, as you can see, uh, she graduated from Louisiana State University, get the master, a bachelor and a master degree there, and then got her PhD in 2017 from Tulane University. I, I believe, Liz, you are a, a girl from Louisiana, right? So uh, uh, now, uh, after the PhD from Tulane, uh, she went to Vanderbilt uh, with our dear friend, Steve Goodbread as a postdoc, and now with the NS, NSF, US NSF National Science Foundation postdoc fellow, is the joint appointment between Lamont at Columbia University and Vanderbilt, and also Netherlands Center for the Luminescence Dating. So uh, um, today is a very, very honor to get her to give us the, that's a, will be a wonderful talk about this two very large river delta system. So Liz, now is your turn. You can share your screen now. Okay, is it good? Okay, great. Well, thank you, Paul, and thanks for having me here today. I'm honored to be part of this seminar series. And as Paul said, I'm going to be talking about dating deltas, showing geochronologic theory and examples from the Mississippi and the Ganges Brahmaputra. And I want to clarify that a lot of what I'm looking at is Holocene time scale and more recent dating, not going back into deep time, with a big focus on luminescence dating, which is my area of expertise. So in this photo here, you can see the Mississippi Delta, the rivers coming through it and the city of New Orleans, um, with the big downtown on the left and then the flood bank on the right. And you can see how high the water level is here, right? So the river's at pretty much bankful stage up within the artificial levee that confines it. And this is one of the types of challenges that we have to deal with. Sorry, could you put yeah. on presentation mode? I'm sorry, is it not showing us that? No. What What are you seeing? We're seeing the the screen with your pictures on the on the side. Oh, okay. Um, I think you need you need to hit that presentation, the PowerPoint. Or the full Try this. Yeah, yes. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for fixing that early. Um, okay, so you can see the delta here. And this is one of the types of challenges dealing with this amount of water and dealing with industrialized landscapes that we deal with in delta science research. Um, but these kind of things are not just modern. If we go back in time, deltas are cradles of civilization, and there's this long-standing history of human landscape interactions and coupled human natural systems in deltas. So this is another area of delta research that's important, is looking at how people can live in deltas over longer time scales and human natural systems, 
And then also we have these channels that tend to evolve with time and change. So the rivers themselves are not static features. This is another aspect that can be incorporated into Delta science research. And while the rivers are changing and depositing new sediment and growing land, we also face issues with subsidence. Like you can see here in um, Ile de Jean Charles, Louisiana, we have this thin strip of land along an old river distributary and people are living on this strip of land, but around it, much of the floodplain has sunk into open water in the US Gulf Coast at this point. So Delta research may feature differences in the dominant and active processes, the things like land building and subsidence and what's driving it, and also in the problems of interest. What, what are you researching? And then also in the timescales over which we're trying to measure things. And so there's this idea that deltas are snowflakes, meaning that each delta is going to be different in the way that it operates. But there are also a lot of similarities and ways that we can draw from similar tools to measure change in deltas. And today I'll be talking about ways that we can measure change in deltas. So in this cartoon, you can see a north to south cross section that's generally representing the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta of the Bengal Basin in Bangladesh. And it's showing several different methods that we can use to measure change in deltas. Um, you can see up in the right corner, we have this Landsat satellite that's going to be taking snapshots um, of the Earth's surface. And we can measure GNSS, which is getting the deeper um, plate movements in both horizontal and vertical movements of whatever this monument is attached to. Archaeological sites can give a lot of information too about past pathways of rivers and how people live with deltas over 100 to 1,000 year time scales. We can go through short-lived radioisotopes. So all these processes happening at the surface and then deeper. I'm not gonna talk through each one in detail. Um, we can measure the way that rivers and tides are moving with ADCP. But the one I really wanna focus on in this um, is these blue and uh, red stars. And these are for, for luminescence dating, which is the main thing that I'll talk about today. So you can see there are quartz OSL and feldspar PIRIR. These are measuring a signal that gets stored within mineral grains when they're buried um, within quartz or feldspar. And I'll talk more about that in detail later. At this point, what I wanna point out is that there are these two different methods for directly dating um, mineral or plastic grain deposition. And that's really valuable because you could see mineral grains are everywhere in the record of lots of deltas. So the way, very briefly, luminescence um, is a natural phenomenon. And some examples you might be aware of are bioluminescence, so living things that can luminesce or can make light, like fireflies. Or in the upper circle, you can see a um, bioluminescent phytoplankton, little critters that are living in the ocean that can glow. And these are generating their own light source through a chemical reaction, but quartz and feldspar fire grains can also luminesce. And you can see here in this circle, the um, sand grains, if they're exposed to sunlight, they absorb a small amount of energy from the sun and this gets trapped in their crystal lattice structure. And it stays there until they're next exposed to sun or heat, and then it's evacuated. And it produces a small amount of light, a little luminescent signal. And because it's reset by light, it, um, it causes them to, to operate as a clock. So they're getting radiation from the sediment surrounding them that causes the energy to store, and then the sunlight is resetting it. So it measures every time they're, they're exposed to sunlight, the most recent exposure. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But first, I want to show some applications of how we can use this tool in the Mississippi Delta. So going to the Mississippi Delta here, um, this is a photo from my study area. And what you can see is the river channel coming down to the right side. And sort of like the picture I showed earlier, just extensive land loss here. Uh, we have an old road that's disappearing into open water. And then this new road is where the photo's been taken from. And it's elevated above the landscape 
to help to connect the mainland with what's now becoming a barrier island at the coast that's very important to oil industry here, so an important port area. And this kind of land loss is something that we see throughout the delta. It's been estimated to have happened at rates of 45 square kilometers per year over the past century. And it's also anticipated that land loss will continue in the delta. Um, but if you look at this image, you can see the red areas are areas that are losing land or anticipated to lose land. And the little green areas, there's a couple of them. One is down here in the lower right corner by the um, birdfoot delta. And another is sort of in the center of the screen at the Wax Lake Delta. These are areas where land is gaining. And it's gaining because river water from the Mississippi River is coming in and it's depositing um, sediment. And so that is the source of a lot of the land that's been built in the Mississippi Delta. This is showing the catchment of the Mississippi River and it's draining a large portion of North America. Um, the different percents are showing the percent water contributed by different tributaries. So you can see a lot of water is coming in from the Ohio River, but a lot of the sediment comes from the Great Plains from the Missouri River. But it all comes down to New Orleans and it doesn't do that evenly throughout the year. The graph that's inset here is showing the water discharge versus um, four different years. And you can see it's highly seasonal. So there are these big peaks and then um, the peaks are generally in the spring and sometimes a little in the fall as well. And then during the winter months, there tends to be less water discharge. So we have a big system with a lot of water and a lot of sediment coming down it um, with people living on the banks, but it's also uh, very seasonal. And that can be incredibly difficult to engineer and manage in a way that's safe to live next to, because like I showed in the cover slide, the water gets up really high in the river. And so this image is showing a boat that's going through the Mississippi River when the river is at Bankful and behind it is uh, the French Quarter, Louisiana of New Orleans. And you can see that the boat is higher than a lot of the, the buildings in the city at this point. So the river is elevated above the land surface because it's confined within these artificial levees. So in these big floods, this poses a, a challenge. And in 1927, there was a very large flood in the Mississippi system and the water got very high within the levee system and it worried people. And specifically, People were worried that the levee was going to break and flood New Orleans or flood another big metropolitan area. And so the government made the decision to dynamite the levee south of the city. And that's what you can see here. This is at Carnarvon in 1927. And on the right, you can see the river is right up at the top of the levee. It's flooding everything. And then the left is showing the flood basin that's been protected from the river by the levee and they're blowing up the levee and allowing the water to go down into this flood basin. So the level of the water in the river will go down. Um, the downside is a lot of farmers uh, live and work down here and it wasn't so good for them to flood the land. But it did lower the stage of the river and that has been preserved today as an engineered river diversion that allows water to exit the levee system when the floods get really high. We have another type of um, flood spillway like this called the Bonnie Carey Spillway that's upstream of New Orleans, as you can see in the image on the left. And this is connecting the Mississippi River to an estuarine lake called Lake Pontchartrain. And the image on the right is showing opening this flood basin, this flood gate and allowing water to flow from the river into the lake down gradient. And what I wanna point out from this is that you can see the river is this brown sinuous thing and the water coming from it is also brown and it's entering this relatively blue lake. And so you can see this plume of sediment coming off of the Mississippi River. And that's really nice for building land because a lot of land loss in the Mississippi Delta is worsened by the disconnect between the river and the floodplain. So not delivering new sediment to offset accommodation that's created by subsidence and other processes. 
so this forms the basis of a proposal to restore the coast or to try to develop a sustainable coast using engineered sediment diversions to feed sediment to the floodplain of the delta. And that's what you can see in these brown circles here. And I think later in the seminar series, Mead Allison is going to talk more about how this works. So I won't go into details now, but we wanted to know what rate of land building the Mississippi River can accomplish under natural conditions. And that can tell us how effective these type of diversion strategies may be for offsetting this 45 square kilometers per year of land loss that's been observed over human time scales. So we approached this um, by looking into the Lafourche subdelta of the Mississippi Delta, which is, you can see this lobe here is Lafourche. And it's one of the most recently active and abandoned subdeltas of the Mississippi Delta. So different parts of the delta were built at different times as the river channel moved. And what I'm showing here are three different chronologies for how this happened. So this is um, Tortonquist from 1996, and that's my PhD supervisor at Tulane. But then there are also these older ones um, from Fraser in 1967, and then there's one from Day et al. in 2007. And I see all of these cited in the literature currently, but you can see they're really different. So if you look at this chart, this is for the initiation when Lafourche began, and the timing can vary by, in this case, a couple thousand years between some of these different sources. And that tells us that there's a real lack of consensus about how some of these areas are building and the fundamental processes that drive them. And so we wanted to look in more detail and get a really robust chronology for the construction of the Lafourche subdelta to better understand how rivers build land and how they can help to offset this kind of change in the coast that we're seeing. Um, and so there can also be a lot of reasons that these may vary, uh, these chronologies, and it relates to radiocarbon dating. These are all chronologies that were established by radiocarbon dating, so dating organic material within the delta. Um, you can see an example of that here. On the left is an image from Thor's 96 geology paper of a site in, um, in Lafourche in the Mississippi Delta. And he is radiocarbon dating this brown peat layer here. The layers above are clastic deposits. Green, is, um, green and yellow are mud and red is sand. And here you can see is uh, some radiocarbon chronology for what underlies it. And so that gives us the last time that it was a swamp by dating this. And here you can see at the top, this age is around 1500 years ago. And at the bottom of this, this age is nearly 5,000 years. So within just a couple of meters, we can have that much of a time difference in the, the organic sediments. And what this means is that if you're radiocarbon dating delta records, you need to be really careful about picking your material. And so there have been some studies here um, Stanley and Haight is a widely cited paper, and this line is indicating sea level. This is depth, and the x-axis is age from radiocarbon, and they're showing a huge amount of scatter in their radiocarbon ages. Um, the point they wanted to make was that these don't correspond to sea level, and there's not a lot of stratigraphic consistency. And while we know that sea level is not rising at this linear rate that's shown here. I think this is still a really valuable figure in showing how wrong radiocarbon can be or how, how much disagreement you can get between ages of the same depth if material is not carefully selected. So things like dating shells that might have a reservoir effect from the waters that they were in or averaging bulk um, bulk radiocarbon over bigger depths or dating particles that might have no relation to the sediment in which they're encased. So radiocarbon, when it's used carefully, can be very accurate, but it hinges on there being organic material available for it. All right, so getting back to what we did in Lafourche, we went out and we hand poured, and we wanted to look at the sediments that make up this portion of land that was built by Lafourche to understand its evolution with time. And what we expect to find in a delta that's growing 
um, and building new land is this package of bay floor mud deposit overlain by a laminated delta front and then a sandy mouth bar and then overbank deposits. And so the bay floor is forming when it's open water, when the land hasn't been built. And then as the river system turns on and starts kicking in coarser sediment, we get this delta front deposit. And when the depot center is right at that point, it dumps a lot of sand and this forms the mouth bar. And the mouth bar grades roughly up to sea level. And then it becomes dominated by overbank flooding processes from the river and the depot center moves seaward. So by OSL dating this mouth bar deposit, we can get, we can track the shoreline of the lobe. And here's another example of what these sediments look like in our Lafouche record. The bay floor is on the left and it has these pieces of shell in it that indicate an open water, brackish water environment. And then the delta front is this laminated feature. And then we get these thick sands that transition to finer grain overbank deposits, which may have organic material in them from plant remains. So we did this at a series of sites within the Lafouche subdelta. And this is showing a composite of our different cross sections from upstream to downstream along one of the primary distributaries of the channel network. And what you can see is this regular um, pattern that I described of the bay floor uh, muds with the shells and then the laminated delta front, and then this about two to three meter thick mouth bar sand that's tracking the shoreline, and then overbank deposits that are thinning from upstream here to coastward to the right. And then there's also this point here um, where it transitions to something different. So here you can see rather than having these um, bay floor deposits and mouth bar sands, we have a peat that's underlaying the overbank deposits. And this peat, again, like the figure I showed earlier, is dating to about 1,500 years old at the top, 1,400 years old. And then at the base, it's much older, again, showing how much, how slow peat can accumulate with time once it's compressed. Um, but it's an important thing to show that the stratigraphy is so different here. And um, I should point out all these ages, these are OSL ages here in 1,000 um, years. And so by looking at this stratigraphy, we were able to track what portion of the delta formed by growth into open water and also to get the timing for that. And so going back, the cross section was going from upstream here down along this main channel. We also looked at smaller channels to the west. And by this, we were able to delineate that about 6,000 to 8,000 square kilometers of new land were constructed by growth into open water in Lafouche. And that you can see the ages on the different channels roughly match each other from this point in distance. So if you go the same distance, we have similar ages. And so the delta starts growing here. Here's the paleo shoreline. And it comes out and it's just growing linearly with all the channels active together at the same time. And so we're able to map the growth using this technique. And we found that the average rate of land growth was six to eight square kilometers per year, which is really impressive. And that builds a lot of land. But um, when we compare that to the historic land loss of 45 square kilometers per year, it shows that these prehistoric or pre-industrial rates of land gain in the delta are dwarfed by the contemporary rates of loss. And that points to humans as playing a critical role in land loss here. And ultimately we concluded that based on this, we're going to see continued loss because even when it's operating under relatively low rates of sea level rise and natural river conditions, the delta wasn't building land fast enough to offset the loss rates we're seeing today in the human modified delta. So we concluded that large portions of the delta are unsustainable. Um, that was, that's a grim finding. We didn't know what we were gonna expect going into that study. And so I would have liked to see a different outcome, but that was what the data showed. Um, but I show this picture not just because it's a grim finding, but this is also a site of significance within the delta. This is a prehistoric or Native American um, earthen mound, and it's got this cemetery built into it because people like to place cemeteries on the highest elevation land. And so this is an artificially elevated 
part of land that's a valuable archaeological site. And these are throughout the Mississippi Delta. So one of the really nice benefits of our land growth map was it allowed us to work on coupled human natural systems in the Delta. Um, all of these dots are indicating different types of prehistoric archaeological sites within the Lafourche subdelta. So I worked with my colleague, Jay Ermeta, who's shown in the upper left, who's a professor at Florida State University. And together we went out and we surveyed a couple of these sites that you can see in the photos here on the right. And then we were also able to reconstruct the time of, um, of construction of about 35 of these sites. Because if we know how old the land is that underlies them, we can at least put a maximum age on the sites themselves. And a lot of these hadn't been previously studied and many were already destroyed to some extent or were in danger of being lost to subsidence and sea level rise. So I show this because natural land histories can provide chronology for archeological sites that might not be able to be dated by other means. Um, and all of this work is possible because we're using this new technique of luminescence that's, that's directly dating the sediment and giving us these high resolution records of land change. And luminescence dating is something that's been used in deltas worldwide. And I'm showing some examples here of, of notable luminescence publications. Uh, you can see that there's been a lot of work done in the rhine meuse Delta. And there's more than I'm listing here for that Delta. Um, we've got some good work in the Mississippi Delta. And then recently there's been some stuff in South America. And then there's really been a lot of work in Southeast Asia and China, especially on the Yangtze Delta. So it's a very exciting avenue for research. Um, but if we look at Yap's graph of where deltas are located, there's really a lot of deltas that the clastic records have not been probed in this way yet. And so I think we have a lot of exciting work left to do as a community in ways we can better explore deltas and how they operate by applying this tool to more places. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about how luminescence dating works. So I said earlier that it's a signal that's absorbed from, um, from radiation in the bulk sediment surrounding clastic mineral grains, and it's reset by sunlight. And this is really valuable if you want to date, like here, we're looking at this exposure in the Ganges Brahmaputra, and you can see it's pretty much all sand. So if you want to know how old something like this is, being able to directly measure sand grains is really valuable. So this cartoon is a schematic of how luminescence dating works. And you can see the grains here are moving. This could be wind transport or water transport. But the idea is that as long as they're getting exposed to sun, their signal is being reset. And that's indicated by them being um, this light tone. And then when they're buried and they're removed from sunlight, they're no longer um, getting reset. And there's little bits of radiation surrounding us everywhere. And over time, this contributes a small amount of energy to the crystal grains that gets stored, uh, a dose of, of radiation, essentially, that's being stored as energy in the crystal grains. And that stays there until they're exposed to sunlight again. So it's a clock for how long they've been buried. So you can see in this arrow here, the deeper the sediments, the longer they've been buried, the more dose they've absorbed, and the stronger their luminescence or OSL signal will be when we capture them and expose them to light in the lab and measure it. So the next step then is to recover this sediment and to not yet expose it to light, but to keep that signal intact. Another way you can think about this is like a battery. So here the battery charge is very high in panel A. And when it's exposed to sunlight, that goes down to hopefully zero. And then with burial, with time, it increases very gradually as it's exposed to the radiation and the sediment surrounding it. And then in the laboratory, we measure it and evacuate that signal again and obtain a measurement of the signal. So here you can see this step four is measurement in a luminescence facility. And uh, this is my colleague Erna at the Netherlands Center for Luminescence Dating. And she's preparing a wheel of sediment samples to measure for luminescence. So if we know this dose of energy that's been absorbed by them, this dose of radiation, 
And then we can also measure the radioactivity of the surrounding bulk sediment. This gives us a dose and a dose rate. So if we divide the dose by the dose rate, then we get time or the age since the sediment was last exposed to light. So you could see on this wheel that Erin is making, she's got little grains adhered to each of these disks that she's placing on the wheel. And we do a number of replicate measures for each sample. And that gives us not just one dose, but a lot of doses, a distribution of them. And so one issue is how we reconcile this distribution to be one dose and one age. And for that, we rely on the beauty of MATLAB. So this is a real boat that um, Mike and I were doing some field work in Bangladesh, and we saw this come up one of the tidal channels in the, near the Sundarbans in the foldered areas. And so in comes the beauty of MATLAB, and it does some statistics on our dose distributions. And what you can see here, this is the relative error on the x-axis, and this is the dose shown as a radial plot. So these are the low dose, less time. These are the high doses, more time. And these are each of those individual subsamples that are measured. And if we apply minimum statistics, we can pull out the population of grains that were last exposed to light. And then if we do a central age model or CAM, we can pull out the average of those values, or we could use a simple mean to do this as well. But you can see there's, there's a minimum population and this gives the likely depositional age or the, the likely dose that captures the amount of time since the last burial episode. And then the CAM is giving the average of all of the subsamples, which is higher, you can see. And this is really interesting because looking at this can tell us information about not just the depositional age, but how much light exposure the grains received on average within a sample. And so this can be used for what we've been calling sediment grading. So fingerprinting sediment and looking at its modes of transport through the delta. And I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but I wanted to point out that to me, this is a really exciting aspect of luminescence dating is that it's no longer simply a chronology tool for providing ages, but it can also be used to trace sediment through systems. So what, what I'm showing here is that we're looking at that difference between the minimum estimate and the central estimate. So the low estimate and the average estimate. And we're calculating a residual dose by subtracting the minimum from the average. And you can see we've done this for a couple of different samples. And this is one on the right where pretty much all of the grains have been exposed to sediment or to sunlight. And so that's telling us that this sample had a lot of light exposure in transit. These are all river samples. By contrast, if we look at this one over here on the left, there's a much more heterogeneous bleaching to it. And this can reveal information about the grain's transit history. So we applied this to some of the samples we worked with for the land reconstruction study in the Lafouche subdelta. And we also looked at the residual doses of modern sediment in suspension and on the bed of the Mississippi River. So here in this figure, we have the depth below the water surface, here's the riverbed. And I wanna point out this axis is a log scale for the residual dose. Um, and we found that fine silt in the water column was very well reset. And so this is telling us that the water column is very turbid and it's delivering these silt grains up to the surface and resetting most of them in the transit process. By contrast, the sediment on the riverbed had residual doses up to um, on average 10 grays. And some individual grains had doses so high they were Pleistocene age. And so this is telling us about how long sediment might be stored on the riverbed or how long it might be moved through the river without getting exposed to light. And I believe that this is a tool that can be used to look at residence times of sand grains in the river. And this is important because I talked about diversions earlier, and these are going to use the sediment within the river to feed the floodplain to try to offset land loss. And one idea is to position these kind of um, structures near riverbed sandbars, but we don't know how quickly these kind of systems recharge. And so luminescence as a sediment fingerprinting tool would be useful for estimating the recharge time of river sandbars. And that would help with understanding how diversions may work. This is something I want to work on in the, in the future. Um, but while I was studying this and the difference in bleaching between river sediments in suspension and on the riverbed, 
I had an opportunity to go to Bangladesh with the Bangla Fire Field School. And so the next portion of my talk is going to be about Bangladesh and the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta and how we can date this densely populated and immense system, a very dynamic system. So this is a slide that Steve shared with me, and it's about the geologic setting of Bangladesh. So here we have a plate collision and it's causing the uplift of the Himalaya mountains. And I know Steve is talking later in this series and I'm sure he'll go into more detail about Bangladesh and the Delta. But in short, this gives us topography. And then there's also a lot of precipitation in part due to the monsoon. And this drives really high sediment yield, the topography plus the precipitation. And so delivered down to the Delta, we have these water resources, sediment, and this gives a very fertile landscape. So here you can see, this is a population density graph and you can see Bangladesh is one of the most densely populated regions on, on earth. So lots of people there. And because there are lots of people there, there's a need for, for understanding how the Delta operates over longer time scales as a baseline and how river channels move to engineer the landscape or manage the landscape in a way that's sustainable and that works with human populations. And so we wanted to test luminescence dating for this system um, using OSL, quartz OSL dating. And the conventional knowledge was that this approach of quartz OSL dating did not work for the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta. And there's a very good reason for that which is that mountains tend to export sediment that doesn't produce quartz luminescence signals. So here you have rapid uplift. This is a photo in the Andes, um, but the mountains are producing sediment that's weathered from igneous or metamorphic rock, and it doesn't have the defects in it to produce a luminescence signal typically. So the quartz that's coming out of these deltas that are at the base of big mountains generally doesn't work for most places because not all OSL signals are the same. So this is showing the good, the bad, and the ugly of quartz OSL. And you can see in the good, we have this really nice decay. So this is the luminescent signal here, and it's going to a background level. This is pretty, and it allows us to create a curve that's showing the time or the dose um, versus the luminescence response. And this is one where we weren't able to get all the feldspar out of it. So the reproducibility is bad and the decay is slower on the signal. But this is the ugly. This is the undateable quartz that just isn't producing any luminescence signal here. So you can see there's no, no quick decay of a signal. And we weren't able to produce a relationship between the dose and the luminescence. Um, and that's what we anticipate for the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta because it's so close to the Himalaya. Here you could see the two big rivers, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra coming down and draining um, from the front of the Himalaya. And that's only 650 kilometers linear from the front of the Himalaya to the coast, the present day coast. So another way to think about that is in the Mississippi system, that would be like if we had the Himalaya sitting up by Memphis. And you can imagine what a different Delta we would have in, in Louisiana if that were the case. So a lot of rapid production of very mineralogically young sediment coming down. Um, so this makes luminescence dating difficult, but unfortunately it also limits the ability of organic material for radiocarbon dating. So this figure here on the left is showing the sediment yield of different three to four different systems uh, versus the dating approach that might be suitable. So in in deltas with a very low sediment yield like the Rhine Meuse, we get a lot of peat production and preservation of in situ organic material for radiocarbon dating. And then in deltas like the Ganges Brahmaputra, we get almost no in situ peat production and preservation in the stratigraphic record. And that's simply because plastics are much more efficient at filling accommodation than organics are. Peat, it grows slowly and like in those, uh, the cross sections I showed earlier from Tor's research, you could see you'd have, once it's compressed, only a couple meters of peat that could represent several thousand years of time. Whereas we can get mouth bar deposits in the Mississippi Delta that are clastic deposits where a couple meters are deposited essentially instantaneously. And so in organic poor deltas, luminescence dating is really important. But 
unfortunately, organic poor deltas often correspond to this active orogeny driving large amounts of plastics to come into the basin. And this corresponds to that low sensitivity of the OSL signal that I showed earlier. And so we decided to test it anyway. And what we found for the sand was exactly what we expected. You can see on the left, there's almost no luminescent signal. And then on the right, we have the quartz silt that we also tested. And we were really pleasantly surprised to find a, a beautiful luminescent signal in the quartz silt. And so this was for just a couple samples we looked at, and we decided to do a more comprehensive test going out and measuring um, different samples of sand and silt upstream and downstream and from different river sources in the delta that you can see our sample sites here. And the graph on the right is showing the age we anticipated for these samples based on archaeological sites that had been dated by other means or Landsat or Google Earth imagery showing when channels um, infilled and we, we sampled the infilled sediment or other uh, like when river bars were deposited. So we had constrained ages for all of our samples. And then we tried this quartz silt dating and we got really nice agreement between the expected age and the age we produced with our approach. Um, and so that was uh, really encouraging. And I I'm sorry, my, my slideshow is not advancing. So give me just a minute while I troubleshoot this. Okay, good. So we have some funding that NSF um, supported us with to go out and now apply this approach to test how the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta is evolving over the time scales we can measure with OSL, which in this system for quartz is up to 25,000 years. And so this is showing within the Ganges Delta plane, there are this series of scroll bar deposits. Uh, you can see all these tiny rivers coming down here, right? And I say tiny, but really these things are 500 meters wide, but they're much smaller than the big braided systems like the Ganges you can see here. And so we're looking at this largely inactive in terms of the big river, Western portion of the Delta Plain. And the dots here are showing sites that we've visited that we've sampled and um, the yellow ones we've already dated the deposits, the green ones are ones that are works in progress and white are places where we took um, borehole data stratigraphy but uh, no OSL samples. And so we're working to reconstruct the fluvial history of this portion of the delta and um, this inset here are a couple of the um, students who I worked with on the project and uh, Nahian and Arif, who are now doing master's programs in the US, continuing to work on um, geoscience. And so we have some really nice landscapes within here that we're looking at. Um, on the bottom here, this is a paleo channel associated with the big river, the Ganges. And we're standing on one bank on the point bar and looking across to this gray line in the horizon is the other bank looking straight across this paleo channel to give you a sense of scale of this system. And so we're going out, we're OSL sampling it to look at the timing of the different channel activities. And then we also found these really cool intrusive plastic sand dikes. And we believe that these record a significant paleo earthquake. So this is another sedimentary archive we're probing with this method. And we're um, in the framework of work by uh, Jean-Louis Grimald, and all. Um, they looked at if you have two different sources of sediment coming into a, a basin, an experimental basin, they found that when those two are confluent, it creates a more stable um, waterway to route sediment and water from the source to the sink. And so we're looking at other processes that might drive river channels to stabilize or to evolve here. Um, aggradation by small channels, or perturbation by earthquakes. And I'm not gonna share more data on that today, but it's something that I hope to show at presentations in the future. But instead, I wanna come back to the main point of this talk, which is how do we date these different landscapes? And now I've given an overview of luminescence dating, including applications to the Mississippi system, but I wanna get into some of these other methods that I show in this figure here. Um, so radiocarbon, we talked about a little bit for the Mississippi 
but it's also been applied to the Ganges Brahmaputra. But as I showed earlier, the material in situ material, so things formed in place like peat, are very rare in this system, especially today. And there was some work by Mead Allison and others um, in 2003 that had dated little particles of organic material that were encased in clastic sediments. And they were able to put together this rough sketch of lobe activity um, within the Ganges from Aputra Delta. And it's generally showing westward to eastward migration of the depot center of the big rivers. But you can see there's a pretty broad age range on, on these lobes. So there's a need to refine this more. And honestly, I was a little skeptical about radiocarbon dating for this system because of what, what I showed earlier with dating non-in situ things doesn't always work for deltas. Uh, but more recently, Steve's group, including some work by uh, Ryan Sinkavage and Celine Grahl and others have posted these really nice radiocarbon chronologies for the delta that are showing, I'm giving an example here, nice stratigraphically in order radiocarbon ages obtained from little particles of wood and leaf that are embedded in the clastic sediments. And I was really surprised to see this because I would expect those to have a much older age than the sediments in which they're encased. But the stratigraphic consistency of this more than 200 data point data set suggests that's not the case here. And so we did a review paper about chronology in this system that's published in ESPL. And I'm gonna show some figures from that now. And one of the things we concluded was that there's low in situ formation and preservation of organics in the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta, but that also corresponds to a low likelihood of old carbon contamination. So when you get these little particles, they generally do have some relation to the sediment surrounding them in this particular delta. And so that means that type of dating can yield really nice, reliable chronologies for this system. Another method that can be used is archeology. span And uh, this is a slide from Mike Steckler, where he's looked at this Hindu temple that's within the Sundarbans National Forest in Bangladesh. And it would have been built to a certain level and has since subsided. So there's this plinth level that should correspond to sea level. And um, by looking at the plinth level and looking at its relationship to present day sea level, as you can see in this cartoon, you can back out a hundred year time scale record of subsidence, centennial time scale record of subsidence. But it depends on where you interpret the plinth level. And this can vary between Muslim and Hindu temples. So knowing about that, the archeological record requires um, knowing about the specific culture that relates to the monument. And so in this case, Mike has revised the, the subsidence estimates by interpreting this record accurately as a Hindu temple. So this points out that archeology span can be really valuable for reconstructing natural processes, but culturally specific monuments require culturally specific analyses. Um, Another resource we have at hand are historical or modern satellite derived maps. And these can show how river channels reorganize with time. So here, this is a figure that Carol Wilson put together and the lower um, portions of it are out of a paper she had in Elementa in 2017. And it's showing channel infilling from Landsat images. And then this can, we can look at this over the short term with satellite data but we can also go back to old maps that are talking about the evolution of the river channels, or in this case, um, mapping old channels. And these are, you know, it's, it's a human interpretation when we're working with old maps. So they tend to focus heavily on things like fortifications or where cities where trade could be conducted are. But the river networks are usually really nicely drawn in these because rivers are such an important mode of transportation. So from historical and satellite derived maps, we can get snapshots in time that historically have a focus on features of human importance. We can also look at short-lived radioisotopes to get accretion rates. And this is something that's been done in um, the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta, but we don't see signals that are typical of the radioisotopes. So this is a figure from our review paper as well. And you can see um, that idealized profiles in the atmospheric production of two radioisotopes of um, cesium and lead are shown here. And ideally there'd be a cesium peak corresponding with bomb activity. 
in, in the mid um, mid 1900s. And then we should expect to see lead uh, taper. It's produced regularly, so it should taper off with time as you go deeper. But here we're so showing typical profiles, and what we really see is no cesium peak and pretty mixed columns of lead. So it tells us that these may not be the best chronometer for the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta, but it does tell us other things about this system. And specifically, we're seeing this degree of mixing with no strong signal for chronology, but that indicates really highly mobile braided rivers, large inputs of sediment, and a lot of reworking of the top surface of the delta. So it's not helping us to get accretion rates, but it is helping us to understand other geomorphic attributes of this basin. We also have Mike Steckler had, has installed these um, geodetic survey systems in Bangladesh where we can get continuous and um, monitored rates of plate motion in the delta. So looking at um, subsidence and uh, horizontal movements down to the base of these monuments. And so, so these are based on whatever the depth of the monument that's measured or that they're attached to. And when they're combined with SETs that Carol's been installing in the Delta, we can get the most shallow component of um, land surface change as well. So combined with these, we can get more information about how, how the land surface is moving vertically and horizontally. And that can be enhanced by looking at accretion rates from marker horizons. So things like brick dust, ceramic tiles that might be put down seasonally and revisited to look at how much sediment is deposited on top of them. So this is another method for looking at, um, at deposition rates in the delta that works over seasonal or event time scales. It hinges on locating the marker when you return, and sometimes that's not so straightforward in any system, but especially in a very dynamic system with high tide ranges and a lot of people in agriculture like the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta. Uh, and then another method that our group is employing is ADCP and tide gauges. So this is a slide from Rip Hale, and he's gone out on boats like the one you see here and measured these uh, tidal signals. So spring and neap tides, um, looking at how tide changes over monsoon season. And then you can also use tide gauges to get at decadal scale changes in um, relative sea level. All right, so we've got all of these methods figured out and um, people who are working on them. So now we get to do the fun stuff, which is combining all of this information together. So here on the right, you can see some of the people I mentioned today who are contributing this expertise to our work in Bangladesh. And, I expect Steve and others will talk more about some of the details of that later in the seminar series. But what I want to talk about is this other figure showing the time scale of resolution of these different methods versus the age range they get. And so at the bottom here, you have things like ADCP and tide gauges that are really capturing um, floods, storms, tides, se and seasonal events. And that can also be um, informed by GNSS, like Mike is doing marker horizons and SCTs. And this starts to push us up into longer timescale processes like human land usage, river channel migration. And here we can use the human history, the um, archeological records and maps as well. Um, INSAR, like what Irina is working with. And then once we get up into radiocarbon and OSL, we can go back deeper in time. Um, to look at avulsion and delta lobe switching. So this is part of my research. And then there's also this, I didn't go into detail about it, but IRSL, which is the same as OSL, but it's using feldspar instead of quartz. And so it's looking at a different mineral to get a luminescence signal that can go further back in time. And this pushes us up into longer term drivers. Um, these time scales are particular to the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta, the records and their extent might vary in other systems. But the point is that by combining these short term records with these longer term records, we can start to integrate across time scales and get a more holistic view of the Delta. So in summary, geochronologic tools are of great value for determining the rate and pace of change in deltas. And this can be critical to establishing pre-industrial baselines for informing this triage step that Jim Best talked about last week and understanding how we can care for and um, manage deltas sustainably for the future, knowing the challenges that are faced.
and the selection of appropriate tools requires consideration of the geologic setting. Like, for example, I showed how luminescence dating may not work as well in some deltas that are fed by mountains, but radiocarbon may not work as well if there isn't in situ material, depending on the delta again. So understanding the geologic setting of the delta is important for choosing the correct um, method for dating and measuring it. And luminescence dating really is key to chronology in a lot of organic core deltas where clastics are the primary mineral we have to work, or primary material we have to work with. And then combined geochronologic and instrumental approaches can measure processes that act over different space and time scales. So this allows for connecting the process scale, what's happening at Earth's surface to the sequence scale, what we're seeing in the deeper time record. Thank you. This is fantastic. You know, uh, uh, your presentation and the method, the summary is exactly what we need in this talk series. Um, that's great because when we talk about source to sink, you know, there's always a connection in the delta progradation. Many people study the, the, the source part, the river routing, you know, sediment yield, and also many people study the, the feet, you know, sediment transport on the shelf. But in terms of the progradation, the timeline, particularly quantitatively defined the historical change of the accumulation of the delta progradation is the missing part. And Yoshi, our friend Yoshi Saito, you know, did a lot of work on Meikang or Yangzi and even Chinese colleague. But if you look at the rest of the world, almost, you know, Amza, Nile, the Indus, and, uh, you know, Mediterranean, you know, uh, uh, African, many other delta, you know, they don't know that kind of Holocene awesome progradation. So uh, wonderful, very good. So uh, our audience, I want to give the audience, if you have any question. So there's yeah. a two way you can ask the questions. Just Why is the before we get started, one quick thing. My son, um, who's eight years old, wants to come say hi. He thinks oh. it's really cool that this is on YouTube. So I'm just gonna grab him real quick, if that's oh. okay. Oh. Hey, so, the audience, if you want to ask any question, you can okay. hit the participants. And then on the bottom right, there's the function call. You can wave. Thank you for your support. Thank you, your mommy give us such a wonderful talk. So, uh, if you want to have any question, you can click. Okay. The Thank you. Thanks for that. And raise your hand. Or if you, you know, you can type your question in text. And, but uh, when you type your question, please make sure to what's your name and uh, where you're from, because sometimes this is all, oh, okay, we have a question here. Uh, Wasif, Wasif, do you want to talk? Or oh, I'm here the question. Uh, Liz, can you click the, the chat? Yeah. This is Wasif, final year PhD um, student at the University of New South Wales from Australia. Currently, I'm working on hydrodynamic of Gendibuma Putra. Thank you for your excellent presentation. And uh, uh, hi, this, uh, hi, yeah. Uh, thank you for your nice presentations. Actually, I am not uh, that much expert on that sedimentation part, but I worked sometimes during my masters in the sedimentation in the Ganges Brahmaputra Magna Delta, and there was a uh, lots of questions about the. Uh, amount of the sediment load from the upstream, like there are lots of controversies, whether it's uh, one billion ton per, in, per year or not. So my question is that like, is the GBM Delta is really uh, getting the elevation from the subsidence or is it losing its height? Oh. Well, what we're seeing with our, our OSL ages that I, I didn't show the data today because we've only dated about half of them so far and we want to get the full data set. But so far, what we're seeing is that over the time scales we're looking at, so hundreds to maybe a millennia, uh, Mike, Mike's group, Mike Steckler's group with Celine Grahl um, as the lead had estimated those rates of subsidence on the order of a few millimeters per year within that delta plane that we're looking at. 
And our aggradation rates that we're seeing for those small channels are also on the order of a couple millimeters per year. So we're seeing that in pre-industrial conditions, the sediment that was delivered by those small channels was sufficient to offset the accommodation created by subsidence, which is really exciting because it's showing those little channels do serve a key role in dispersing sediment across the delta plain and offsetting subsidence. Um, I, I don't know the answer for the modern system. It's not something I've looked at too much, but I expect that it's something that um, Steve might know more about, or I know. Irina has looked at some rates of deposition on the coast, um, and Carol Wilson has as well. And I think as we get more information out of some of Carol's SETs and some of Mike's continuous monitoring station, we might begin to form a better answer to that. Yeah. Okay. Mike, do you want to add to that? I know you know well, a lot I about mean, that. If you look at um, you know, some of the works that other, other people have done, I mean, by the Magna River mouth, is still actually gaining land. And then as you go along the coast, um, you start to see more land loss as you go west. Um, and it, it only starts to become serious when you reach India. Um, although in, in Bangladesh, some of the land loss is, is happening farther inland where there's a paucity of, of sediments in the, in the polder area. And Carol has shown that that's being offset in part by the filling in of, of channels. It also though, you know, differences aside, it really is an incredible amount of sediment coming down the system. So one of the reasons I was really excited to work on that system was because I think there are a lot of resources there for a very hopeful future. Okay, okay wonderful. Uh, next question. So you can Thank read you. Ahead or you can just go ahead and ask. Okay, before we waiting people ask a question, I want to do, I have a request for the, for the audience here before people left. And uh, so, uh, let's see, clear? You know, we have a very good uh, list of uh, the speaker on the list, but, uh, we, but we also need uh, more people can talk about following rivers, like the Yukon River, particularly with the global warming, global change, how the sediment discharge change, or even the Delta. Not so many study, but some people study this. Please recommend it to me. People talk about Colorado, all the way the dam, human impact, also the Delta response to that cutting sediment and water discharge. And the Magdalena and the San Juan, small river, even Orinoco, you know, uh, Bob, Bob Mead did uh, early, some earlier work and the Bio Bio small river, San Francisco that we've dominated and the Rio de Plata. And in the Europe, the Ebro river, the Rhine river, even the Shot Alaba river, Congo, Niger, and the Russia rivers. We, you know, even the Amo River, if you know some good colleague can contribute a good uh, presentation, please let me know. Thank you. Okay, continue. If any, any question, you can raise your hand or you can just uh, unmute yourself and go ahead to ask. There are questions later too, or if something comes up, please feel welcome to email me. Any 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 new question? It's a new message. Um, oh, I see one. Yeah, it says um, from Cheng Peng Pan from the Chinese Academy of Science. And they're quite interested in how do you distinguish the mouth bar and the delta front deposit in, in the dating work? Um, the mouth bar is incredibly sandy compared to the delta front. So the delta front is a much finer grain matrix that has some sand laminations in it. And that's because the, the mouth bar is forming when the depot center is right there and it's delivering all of the coarsest sand load to that point. But the delta front is forming when the depot center is still relatively inland and sand is only coming in in storm events or really um, flood events, like high energy events. 
And so when we're doing this work by hand coring, we can feel the difference before we even see the sediment. It's, um, it's that dramatic. And then recovering the sediment, the sand is very clean and homogenous in the mouth bar. And in the delta front, it's, um, it's this mud instead. I hope that answered your question. Thanks for your question. Also, Liz, you show the Mississippi River, and this is the first time I saw that progradation from 1.5 thousand years and to, that's so wonderful. But, uh, you know, in most of Asia River Delta, like a yellow, Yangtze, Pearl River, the Mekong Red River, uh, colleagues have already come out the progradation, you know, from 6,000 years. But did you put a comparison mode? Because the Mississippi River, the human impact only lasts 300 years, but in the Asia, most of up to 2000 years. Did you see any that kind of historical jump of the sediment, just a volume, you know, back 2000 years? Of yeah, we don't have information about pre-industrial sediment for the Mississippi that's very well constrained. Um, so we don't know if how representative that is of present day scenarios. Yeah, because recently a couple of colleagues in China or in Asia, they tried to reconstruct the past 7,000 years uh, based, on, based on the Delta accumulation to see yeah. how the discharge. And uh, I, I, we have a very interesting look at the thousand years, you know, in the past thousand years, how much sediment coming down from the Sibir River Will be yeah. reflect as 300 years of human impact or climate or anything? Um, I know there's some speculation that Native American agricultural practices um, and like forest burning events had affected the sediment flux in prehistoric times in the Mississippi Delta. That's been proposed. Um, I, I really don't think we know that, or certainly I don't, I don't know it. Um, what the sediment load of the pre-industrial river was during Lafourche's time. But one thing we do know is I showed those lobes um, of the Mississippi River. So cycling from the Lafourche lobe and prior to that was the St. Bernard lobe and then the modern. And there's, they're not like they shut on and shut off in sequence. There's a huge amount of temporal and spatial overlap between lobes in the Delta. So it's, it's convenient to think of them as these discrete packages but really they're sharing water for part of their time. So in Lafourche, we know that the um, modern river channel turned on around a thousand years ago, but the Lafourche subdelta, and that distributary network was active from 1600 to 600 years ago. So for the second half of its lifespan, it was sharing the river discharge with the modern river channel. And despite that, we see this linear rate of progradation, which I think is really interesting because you would expect it to, to decrease, right? If it's sharing with another part of the Delta, but that's not what we see in the record. That's very interesting. Yeah. And I think it raised some more questions and I'd love to get back to that system and do some follow-up work and look at the interdistributary areas and what's happening, not just on the banks of the channels where we worked, but in the area, the marshy area in between the channels. Mm -hmm. I think that could tell us more about how it's able to sustain a linear rate of growth, especially when sharing with other systems. Okay, wonderful. Is there any other question, any other comments? Anybody want to share anything briefly? Yeah, here is a comment on the, cha uh, on the chat. Uh, Lenok. Uh, Utrecht University. Yeah, it's a very interesting presentation. You have a very comprehensive overview of your work. I enjoy a lot. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, if not... I'm uh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I have a question. I, I don't know if it's um, related or I'm talking um, since. So, um, well, I'm Ian. I'm from Boston University. Um, so I study marsh, and uh, when you when in your presentation, when you show that cross section, um, there is a layer of sandy sediments, and then uh, showing uh, recording the shorelines, and then after that, you said the transition to something different, and I see a layer of peat. So um, I'm wondering, in your dating, is it um, is it feasible to show 
the extent of marsh covering on the shorelines over time, or is it not something um, not doable? I don't know. Um, so in the cross section that I showed, it's going from upstream to downstream, and that, that peat is showing where there was land before the Lafouche system turned on. So that's showing like the pre-Lafouche marsh, if that makes sense. And then the, the layer of sand is tracking the growth of new land. And you can see there's not a lot of organics shown in that cross section for the new land that's formed. But if you look at the paper and go into the supplement, we show all the cross sections that informed that one transect. And um, within those, we see something really interesting that is on the top of the sand. Um, so when it's building new land and you get that sandy deposit that's tracking the shoreline, right above that, there tends to be a really, as it transitions to overbank deposition, um, so deposition from the river flooding after the land is built. Um, between the top of that emergent sand package and the thick overbank package, we often see it at the base of the emergent of the overbank package, really fine grain material and often with some kind of peat or organic component. So what that's telling us is that as the delta builds the new land, it's staying relatively low elevation, like near the water surface for a while getting colonized by plants and the plants start to trap the sediment and um, help the overbank to aggrade and help to build up. And once it gets natural levees, then we see it transition to a different kind of more um, coarse grain deposition of overbank. But yeah, right after the land emerges, we do in some of the cross sections see evidence of a marsh unit there. It's not something that I've looked at in, in large detail and we didn't do radiocarbon dating of that marsh deposit because it, it wasn't relevant to the question that we were asking, but it's something that could be looked at in the future for okay. different questions about okay. marshes. Okay, Liz, there's a one, more, one more question on the chat. Yeah. You uh, try to answer briefly. It said, uh, uh, would, it, would there be possible recent deposit in the, re in the recent hundred years from flood or lack on the old one? Yeah. Um, in, in the Mississippi Delta, I think the question is about, and in Bayou Lafourche was, um, it, you could see the old river channel. So this past pathway of the river and that's been maintained. But in the early 1900s, it was artificially cut off from the modern river because it was posing a hazard to people living on its banks because it was still getting those springtime floods and people didn't like their towns flooding. So Lafourche was separated from the modern Mississippi distributary network in 1903, I think 1904. And as a result, we don't see a river flooding signal there, but you could still get coastal flooding um, and coastal storms. So it'd be possible to get some coastal deposits outside the levee there. Right now, a lot of that area is it's bouldered or levied. So it's, it's a pretty artificial landscape in that regard. Oh, fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Liz. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is fantastic. So as I mentioned in the beginning, this presentation, this talk, including the question and answer portion uh, has already been recorded on the YouTube channel. And I already put the link on the chat. And you, you always can come back, rewatch it. And after 24 hours, we will put a caption on it. So the international audience can uh, play slowly, you know, can watch word by word. And uh, you're welcome to forward to your colleague, to your student. Once again, if uh, you feel you also can give a source to think related presentation or your colleague or your poster or your student, please let me know. We will try to host. And uh, now we are building a wonderful uh, series and the playlist on the YouTube. So uh, thank you very much again, and please come back next Wednesday, uh, same time. So I'll see you next week. Thank you, Paul. Thanks okay. for hosting. Sure. See, uh, thanks again for your song. Okay. He's very cute. Oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Bye. Bye.